Okay, few more slides, and then we can do tutorials and practice and quiz. Now, from linear algebra, you remember that the principal stresses are the eigenvalues and so on. I said that already, but with the principal stresses, with the eigenvalues come eigenvectors. So each of the three principal stresses will have its own eigenvector with certain properties, which you will see in the practice and later again and again. But just following the linear algebra procedure, how do you get the eigenvectors? Normally, I would ask you in a poll, but I cannot interactively do this. Sorry for that. A little bit more interaction would be good. So how how I hope you most of you still remember how to get the eigenvectors. We will practice this again and again. No worry. Now take the the, the matrix which we, from which we calculated the determinant before. This is the equation system with which we want to solve. If you have a solution sigma one, insert it here. Before it was sigma. Now we choose sigma one. Then we get n one and two and three eigenvector components belonging to this one. OK, and how do you solve a system of equation of equations? OK, you break it. I mean, there are many different ways. There's not the right and the wrong way. Uh, one way is to break down the system into subdeterminants, working with that. Finding, resolving n1 as a function of n3 and two as a function of n3 and finding, identifying these two factor factoren or constants now now it's constants so i can say constants and find the relation this way find the relation between n1 and n3 and n2 and n3 okay and then finally using the normalization condition n components must follow this because this is the norm of the n vector we know the norm of a unit vector must be one okay so we can solve this way the system of equation and this is then called the eigendirection or first principle direction of the stress tensor and having chosen one here after sorting means it's the direction which belongs to the largest eigenvalue and let's stick to that that makes discussion and interpretation much easier later when we have a sorting okay and the same principle you do for three this is calculation intensive. If you do this by hand for all three vectors in the XM, typically we will not ask you for all three. We will typically ask you for one, maximum two. And sometimes the solution is very simple. This is calculation intensive. You can spend quite some minutes with doing these calculations. Uh, with practice, you become much faster. Okay, anyway, uh, the three principal directions are then when you convince yourself, when you have some of them in some of the examples tested they should be perpendicular to each other there are mathematical reasons and rules for this but convince yourself when you calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors convince yourself that they are per indeed perpendicular to each other okay so far so good now <coughs> this was repeating linear algebra in principle, I hope I have not done anything new for you. I only was using different words than the math teachers which you heard about talking about this. Now we talk about stress and not about eigenvalues and eigenvectors in general. That was the only difference I hope for you. And otherwise you recognize the procedure. You should be able to, to do it now. And that was also the reason why we kept this exercise. Because in principle, you could have done V0, 6, 7, 8 at least if you remember your linear algebra. OK, now. Now comes the interpretation. The sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, you could write them in a vector, vector. Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 could be components of a vector, but actually, no. This is then a column, but not a tensor, if you do that. If you want to keep the tensor property, then you sh then you must keep the matrix structure of the tensor, and then you can put the sigma one, sigma two, sigma three on the diagonal. Now, remember the question with which this section started. Is it possible to orientate the area ABC such that the direction of stress vector and normal vector is parallel? 
I told you before, this means that there are no diagonal stresses. OK, keep that in mind until I switch back. Sigma 1, 1 component is the normal stress. Sigma 1, 2 component is the shear stress on phase 1, but there is no shear stress, so it must be 0. There is no shear stress in the 3 direction, in the z direction also. There must be 0. OK, so Sigma 1 has now an interpretation. It is the normal stress on the 1 phase in the special situation that the Cartesian coordinate system and the eigensystem, the eigenvectors of the tensor, are parallel. Or with other words, this is the representation of the stress tensor in its eigensystem. OK, and only here we are diagonal with all the zeros on the non-diagonal. The stress in principle system or principle stress formulation is only diagonal, and this object here is still a tensor, whereas putting those three numbers in the vector would destroy the tensor property, the transformation properties. OK, and almost finished with defining these things, I mentioned the word stress invariance before. Now, the I1 is not much simpler. It's just the sum of the diagonals. The I2 is now the sum of three products of two respective. So one, one, two, two, three, and three, one. OK, so I2 is a relatively simple calculation. And I3 is actually the, a very simple calculation. It's only multiplying sigma 1 with sigma 2 with sigma 3. OK, so now the stress invariants, which were lengthy calculation on the previous slides, have now suddenly become very short calculations. OK, so if we ask you for stress invariance, see whether you cannot first calculate the eigenvalues, or maybe they are given already, and then calculate the stress invariance this way, instead of doing it the complicated lengthy way here. Both are correct, only this is much more work. So sometimes you can sp save quite some time by using your insights that if a stress tensor is in its eigensystem, the invariant calculations are simpler. OK, so this is a trick to save time and effort. Now, why are these things called invariants? And this is something which I told you last time already for vectors, tensors of first order. Now I repeat myself for tensors of second order and bring you into the context. So scalars have a number and are already invariant for coordinate transformation. Scalars do not change when you change your point of view, when you change your face, uh, your head orientation. Scalars are invariant by themselves. Vectors have a norm, which is invariant, and they have a direction. So the norm of a vector is its one invariant which a vector has. A tensor, on the other hand, this tensor in three dimensions has three invariants. Three. Why three? Because we are in three dimensions. In three dimensions, we can do three cuts. We get three planes on the cube, with the opposite ones uh, discussed before. So three planes, three eigenvalues, three invariants of the stress tensor. And the invariants I1, I2, I3, they come from the characteristic equation. The invariants sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, these are the normal stresses on the stress cube in the eigensystem representation. OK, and they are related to each other because the stress tensor has only three independent eigenvalues, either sigma 1, 2, 3 or I1, I2, I3. It's not six, it's three. OK, now, if you accept the fact that there are invariants, then keep in mind how many invariants can a tensor have. Higher order tensors can have many invariants. For rank 4 tensor can have 21 independent invariants, for example. Uh, this is not good to think about too much. You don't need it in my lecture. 